And gracious God, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for this group gathered here this morning. And just ask for your wisdom and discernment as we look at this parable of the wineskin, as it's revealed to us in three of the Gospels, and what its meaning would be for us today in a time when wineskins are no longer relevant or we don't even see them any place we go. So just give us your insight and your gleaning of the scriptures to just be able to help us move closer to you in everything that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so this parable of the wineskin is um, kind of an interesting parable because, again, you don't hear a lot about it because nobody uses wineskins anymore. And so I want to start by just showing you a little video of what a wineskin would look like and how it would function to ferment the wine, ferment the grapes uh, so that they would turn into wine. And I'm going to share the screen. And if you can't... ...of wine skins that Jesus uses in his parable is less familiar in our day. Wine was made by crushing grapes in a wine press with the juice flowing to a wine vat. In the warm climate of Palestine, grape juice would begin to ferment very quickly. After the initial fermentation, the wine was strained to separate out sediment. After four to six days, it was poured into clay jars lined with pitch or animal skins for storage and further fermentation. Wine skins were made of whole tanned goat skins with the legs and tail cut off and sealed and the neck tied off once the wine had been poured in. Wine needs to ferment without access to oxygen as the yeast consumes the natural sugars in the grapes. A byproduct of the fermentation is carbon dioxide, which in modern wine escapes through an airlock. But in the wine skin, it would seep through the seams of the neck and limb openings. The whole large skin would be bulging, almost to bursting, as the carbon dioxide forces its way out during the next two to four months of fermentation. The stretching process, in addition to the alcohol content of about 12%, would destroy the natural resiliency of the wineskin and its ability to contract and stretch, again, would be lost. Jesus' hearers would have understood the fermentation and the aging of leather and hence the meaning of the parable. New wine cannot be put into old wine skins, lest the pressure burst the now inflexible skin and the wine would be lost. A new container, a new way of thinking, and a new spirit is needed to contain the new things that Jesus Christ brings. Okay, so I wanted to show you that because I think it, it helps us visualize what the wine skin looks like and why they would have used a wine skin. When I think of a skin of an animal, I think of the, you know, something you'd, you'd, like a rug, <laughs> you know, something that you'd put on the floor. I don't think of the skin as being the whole animal without feet or tail, you know, and all tied together and sewn together so that it becomes a vessel. Um, so I thought that was very interesting to see kind of the process of fermentation and how the grapes became wine in Palestine back when, when Jesus was alive. So this parable occurs in three different Gospels, the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, pretty much the same in all three Gospels. There's minor difference in Luke and Mark. Mark and Matthew are pretty much the same. So let's begin by looking at Mark chapter 2, verses 18 through 22. And let's see who has that. Nancy, do you have that? 
You have to put your, okay, all right. Carol, do you have it? You can put your audio on? Thanks. Yes. Um, Martin Luther King, 18, a discussion about fasting. Once when John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, some people came to Jesus and asked, why don't your disciples fast like John's disciples and the Pharisees do? Jesus replied, do wedding guests fast while celebrating with the groom? Of course not. They can't fast while the groom is with them, but someday the groom will be taken away from them and then they will fast. Besides, who would patch old clothing with new cloth? For the new patch would shrink and rip away from the old cloth, leaving an even bigger tear than before. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, for the wine would burst the wineskins, and the wine and the skins would both be lost. New wine calls for new wineskins. Okay, so let's go back to the beginning of these verses that Carol read, and it talks about people were wondering why the disciples and Jesus weren't fasting. In the more um, the stricter sect of Judaism, so this would be the Pharisees, the scribes, and those people who were the religious leaders, they would fast twice a week, Monday and Thursday, supposed to be from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., then they could eat dinner. So it was for a period of about 12 hours. It wasn't as though they went for 24 hours without eating. But what they would end up doing is making sure that everybody knew that they were fasting when they did. So these scribes and Pharisees would paint their faces white. They would wear disheveled clothes. They would go around the village so that everybody could see that they were the ones who were fasting. And so that people would see just how faithful they were. So obviously right there that um, bothered Jesus quite a bit because Jesus all along in his ministry is telling us, you know, your faith is about your relationship with God and one another. It's not supposed to be a one-upmanship, you know, I'm doing this, but you're not, therefore I'm more faithful than you are. It's not supposed to be about that. And it's supposed to be about growing in your faith and growing in your discipleship. But he tells us that the wedding guests cannot fast while the bridegroom is with them, can they? What is that talking about? It's talking about the fact that Jesus is the bridegroom. Jesus is the one who's come to usher in this new way of life, this new way of, of living, this new way of worshiping God, um, setting all the misinterpretations on their head, um, helping people to understand what it really means to worship God and what the kingdom of God really looks like. So that's what Jesus is doing. But why is he the bridegroom? Because he's ushered in this new kingdom of God. And so the church is likened to, you know, the, this, is, this is the kingdom on earth. The church is the kingdom on earth. But Jesus is the one who's come and is showing us what God is like. And he's also showing us what the the bridegroom will look like at the end of the age. So if he is, in essence, married to the church, which is what we are, the body of Christ, then he is the groom. Well, who are the disciples? At the time of Jesus, they would have a bridal party, but much bigger than where we would think of it today. And of course, they don't all, they wouldn't all dress up and walk down an aisle the way the groomsmen or uh, the bridal party would be in our day and age. But instead, they literally stayed with the groom um, until he would appear to the bride. And if you remember in some of the other stories we've talked about, weddings 
people received notice that there would be a wedding, but there was usually not a specific day because there were so many factors that could enter into it, whether it was weather or whether it was you know, crops on the farm where you literally just didn't have time to stop what you were doing. So they never knew exactly the day or the hour that the groom would go to meet the bride and nor did the bride. So the bride had a group of friends who would help her continually to be prepared just in case tonight was the night. And then the groom had these group of groomsmen who did as well. And so this is what he's talking about. As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. So why would the disciples want to take the time out to fast if the bridegroom is with them? Why would they want to do that while Jesus is present? But it's not only because Jesus is present, but when you are attending a wedding, it is that supposed to be the happiest day in the bride and groom's life. And in Palestine, you weren't allowed to go and observe the Jewish law. You weren't allowed to fast. You weren't allowed to do some of these very rigid, you know, legalistic things that they were told to do. Why not? Because nothing was supposed to take away from your joy of the day. And so, in essence, Jesus is saying, just as in a wedding, if you are one of these groomsmen, or you are the groom, you are not going to be fasting, you're going to be celebrating and be joyful that the groomsman is here and that the wedding is going to take place. Similarly, that's how you should be since I am here on earth. You know, they don't know it's only three years at this point. But since I am here on earth and I'm teaching you, don't take the time to divert your attention to anything else, number one. And then secondly, why wouldn't you be joyful? You know, why are you fasting? Why are you being sad? Why are you um, disciplining yourself and keeping yourself from the joyous uh, celebration of being with the bridegroom. So that's what he's saying in that first part of, of the parable. And of course, we miss some of this because we don't think of there being a bridal party per se uh, in the way that we would know one today. Uh, back then, there was. And of course, that they would know that. The people of Palestine who were listening to this would know that. And they would know that these groomsmen would be attentive to the groom and they'd all be celebrating because this was a joyous occasion of marriage. Um, and part of what has been happening, you know, over these years, we had the old law of Moses with the Ten Commandments, and that was a covenant between the people of Israel and God. And then Jesus came and ushered in this new covenant. So he fulfilled the law of the old covenant, but he came to show us this new way of living and new way of worshiping God. So he's come to do all that. And they are those who are most rigid in their ways of worshiping God are these religious leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees, the ones who are trying to obey every last law that exists, that was not in existence at the time Moses received the Ten Commandments, but over the years kept being added and added in order to explain the Ten Commandments, but they got ridiculously out of hand. And so, you know, Jesus is trying to correct that total misunderstanding of what worship was like, what God was like, what the kingdom of God was like, and how they should be living their lives. Um, the only way to grow closer to God is, is not self-flagellation. It's not, um, you know, there, there are reasons for fasting, but they were taking fasting so out of hand that instead of becoming something that would fuel them, something that would draw them closer to God, instead it became a ritual and it became you know, a way of demonstrating to others how pious they were. And so 
That's what Jesus is objecting to here in terms of the fasting that was going on. But not only was fasting supposed to be twice a week, but also even prayer, even the prayer life was directed. So they were supposed to pray three times a day at certain times of the day. And everybody was just supposed to stop what they were doing. And then everybody would pray together uh, wherever they were. And they knew the prayers that they were to say. It was, um, you know, very, again, very ritualistic. They all knew um, the prayers of Moses that they, and the prayers of David that they were supposed to say. So this had become such a ritual that, again, people forgot how to talk to God. People were no longer going to God out of love or out of um, concern for their families or for their friends, but people were praying these rote prayers three times a day and believing that they were satisfying God by doing that, by following these rigid principles. So Jesus was trying to correct all of those misunderstandings in this parable of the wineskin. So he says in Mark's gospel, no one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old cloak. Two things would happen. One thing is you'd ruin the old cloak because you'd cut a piece of the old cloak in order to put it on this new garment. Um, or I'm sorry, you'd, you'd ruin the cloth <laughs> that was being used to mend this old cloak. The old cloak was already ruined and needed a patch. But, you know, we all know, because if you've ever done this with jeans or um, we all know the principle behind if there's something that's made out of cotton, for example, and then you don't shrink it before you sew it on something, it will then shrink. And what happens when it shrinks? It pulls the, the um, threads out and it, because it shrinks, then that whole garment um, tears apart as a result of it. So he's, that's what he's saying. Now it's a little bit different in the gospel of Luke. And I want you to look at that too. And in the Gospel of Luke, let's look at chapter 5, 30 to 39. And he, he says here, verse 36, he also told them a parable, no one tears a piece from a new garment and sews it onto an old garment. Otherwise, the new will be torn, and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. So, in other words, he's saying the law that they are following has become so misinterpreted, so far apart from the meaning of the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments were all there in order to promote life and peace and justice among people, love for family and neighbor and love for God. So that those five commandments were a vertical relationship between the person and God. And then the rest of the commandments were all horizontal, the relationship between God, between the person and neighbor and family. So that was the purpose of the Ten Commandments, to help the Israelites live in close relationship with God, the vertical, and then with one another. So love the Lord your God with heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. That was the whole purpose of the Ten Commandments. But then by the time we got to Jesus' day, there was no longer love. There was no longer joy. There was no longer caring for neighbor. Everybody was so caught up in what these rules and regulations were, what they weren't allowed to do on the Sabbath day, what was considered work 
you know, th so that if they did any, then they'd have to, um, you know, pay for it with obeisance and being outside of the gates of Jerusalem for a week and, you know, having to stop work for a week in essence, if they did this. So they were so caught up in that, that they could no longer see God and no longer see each other. They were too caught up in just trying to stay focused on what they needed to do in order to earn their way into heaven, which is how people looked at it. And that's why Jesus kept saying over and over again, you know, right before the passage in Mark, Mark chapter two, when we look at this parable of the wineskins, right before that, he says, this is verse 17, Mark chapter two, when Jesus heard this, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick and I've come to call not the righteous, but the sinners. That's why he says that, because in, in essence, they are all sinners. They just don't see it. They don't see it among themselves. They think it's the tax collector. They think it's the leper. They think it's the woman. They think it's the widow. You know, they think these are all the sinners. But Jesus is saying, trying to say to him, you know, I need to go to those people first in order to make a point to you that they are just as deserving as the kingdom of heaven as you are. So that's, you know, that's why he's doing this um, and why he starts with that in Mark's gospel before he tells them about the bridegroom and, and um, the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away and then fasting will be appropriate because you're going to be sad that this bridegroom is taken away. Um, and then goes into this parable of the wineskin. So this is also the first mention of death in Mark's gospel. Nobody got it at this point in time, you know, when Jesus is saying that the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from you, and then you can fast on that day. Nobody understands that he is the bridegroom and that he's the one who will have to go away. Um, but we do, because we're reading this in retrospect, of course. So it's, you know, this is why this whole idea of the wineskin emerges, because their wineskin, what they have designed as religion, what they call religion, what they call worshiping God is very confined, very structured. There is no give and take. There is no grace, no mercy, no love in any of it. So their wine skin is old, it's brittle. And Jesus is saying to them, if you try to put anything new into that wine skin, it's going to burst and crack. It can't take anything new that I am teaching. You have to put it in a new wineskin. Well, what's the new wineskin? The new wineskin is a whole new way of being together as a community of faith, which is what the disciples were doing with Jesus. And then, of course, the whole Christian church emerging after Jesus' death and resurrection. So there are so many um, applications, I think, to this parable as we think about it, you know, in the church and in our own lives. But before we start talking about the church in our lives, let me just say one other thing. It wasn't just the wineskin that had to change, but it was what went in the wineskin that had to change too. So, you know, they were, they say that aged wine tastes better. And that was their thinking of the time that, well, gee, all these laws were in existence for all these years, it worked. 
We knew what we were supposed to do. We knew how to earn our way into the kingdom of heaven. Now Jesus is coming, telling us he's the bridegroom. He's the son of God, which he hasn't told them yet in the gospel of Mark. But, you know, he's coming, teaching them this whole other way of seeing God, observing God, worshiping God, living their lives. Not only can it be contained in this pre-existing wineskin, their conception of a community of faith in the Jewish community at this time, but also the, they themselves had to change in order to be a part of this new wineskin that was being created. So this whole idea, it wasn't just getting a new wineskin, but it was transforming themselves in order to be part of this new wineskin that was necessary in order for them to draw close to God and be a part of this new community of faith that Jesus had ushered in with his disciples. So there's this whole idea of change and transformation that's a part of this parable. And you know, you think about it, what's happening inside this wineskin is change. It's all fermentation, letting go the carbon dioxide, expanding, the gases expand, um, and the wine, the grapes ferment. The longer they're in the wineskin, the better tasting the wine is. That's their whole mentality and their whole philosophy. So the more years of your life you've followed the law of God, done all those things you're supposed to do, then the better you are and the closer you are to God. That was their whole mentality. And Jesus is saying, no, you can't put a new patch of cloth on an old garment. You can't put new wine in the old wine skins because in both cases, you're going to ruin it. You're going to ruin the, the piece of cloth that it's sewn into. You're going to ruin the vessel that it's poured into. It's going to burst. So you're going to lose both the wine, both yourself, your, the in, what's inside that wine skin. You're going to lose both yourself and your community of faith in the process. You've got to change from the inside out, and you've got to create a new structure of worship and faithfulness to God. Okay, so I'm going to unmute you so that we can talk a little bit. Oops. Oh, you can just unmute yourself. Sorry, I forgot. I get mixed up between Sunday morning and Bible study. <laughs> <laughs> you can unmute yourself. Um, yeah, so does this, you know, what, what do you think of as you think of this parable of the wine and the wine skin and how it relates to us, both as a community of faith and as an individual? Do you agree with it? Do you agree with that you can't sew a piece of untrunk cloth into an old cloak, not literally, but figuratively. You know, think about the changes in the church. The, the church with a capital C, as well as the church with a small C. Hmm. Is change easy? I think of, um... The wineskin, I really liked that video that you showed us. It it really made sense to me. I had no idea. Kind of disgusting too, but yeah, I love your <laughs> but um <laughs> thinking of the fact that that the wineskin expanded and it needed to be flexible. Mm. And I think of the church needs to be flexible 
when new ideas and thoughts come in and be flexible to the changes in our world. And then of course, I think of our new addition, Living Next Door, I see it every day and think of how that will be like a new wineskin for us mm -hmm. and the need for us to be flexible with the changes, especially from being away due to COVID. We're all coming back as different people with different priorities now, I think. Yeah, and I'm actually going to talk a little bit about that on Sunday. Um, you know, just I feel very much that we're being given this opportunity to have this new wine skin. And then the question becomes, what do we put in it? You know, I, have a, I, have a quick, I have a quick question that maybe just ran through my mind. Maybe somebody knows the answer. Was there any use for the old wine skin? Well, it would burst. You know, once you, you couldn't reuse it. Once you use the wine in the wine skin, you couldn't reuse it. It would be too brittle. But I mean, was there any use for that beyond it? Like a not a recycling, but you could, I don't know, grind it up and use it for your soil. Or I mean, was there any? Or was it just I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> you know what I mean? Was there some way it was still used? Because it, it actually people didn't, they used things all the way to the end. You know? I don't know. <laughs> always I some, know. some use beyond it. No, no commentator talked about that. <laughs> I just Googled it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, to recondition it, an old wineskin needs to be cleaned and then soaked in oil. The wineskin is soaked until it is rejuvenated to its supple and soft state to be ready for the new wine. Huh. So old wineskins are not thrown away or only being used to hold old wine. It can be made fresh again to hold new wine. Oh, how about that? Bingo. So there you mm -hmm. go. That's exactly what you're talking about, Lynn. The new it church. Actually, it, that gives us hope, right? Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. Because if it can be reconditioned, um, it gets a little away from the point of Jesus' parable there, you know, and saying that you can't put new wine, mm -hmm. old wineskins. And he doesn't say, now, if you oil the wine skin and recondition it, then you can't, you know, he doesn't say that in the parable, but, you know, he's made his point. Well, maybe that wasn't known at that time, you know, that you could do that to use it onward. But mm -hmm. it's interesting that we've now discovered that you can reuse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And have you ever watched some of these, you know, nature, these wild nature shows like with Bear Gryllis, you know, going someplace and, you know, and it's cold and, you know, <laughs> taking the animal skin and, well, anyway, it gets kind of gross. But anyway, then, you know, <laughs> um, making it supple by making sure it's in water and, and then drying out and then it's more flexible than, I don't know. Have you seen any of this Alaska? There's a show about Alaska. Um, and this family who lives off the grid in Alaska, no? Oh my gosh, I love that show. So yeah. it's <laughs> fascinating. They're just incredibly creative with what they come up with and, and how they, um, you know, even like making a windmill um, or, you know, it's just, anyway, yeah. So it reminds me of this, <laughs> let's put it that way. Um, yeah, I think I didn't. I didn't notice one one thing. I didn't notice. Did not know too. Uh, when you mentioned that they, the groom, they don't set a date for the wedding. They just yeah. wait for the proper day, and then the groom decides when the wedding will be. Yeah, go to. I mean, it sounds like it, there could be a three week bachelor party. You know, until he makes up his mind. It is time to go get her. I mean, you don't want to leave the groom, so you might as well stay and have fun, right? Well, that's so, that. I did not know that he was the one possible. that made the decision. Yeah, that is possible. And, you know, we're talking about rural communities here, too. So a lot of it was just dependent on, um, first of all, how long it took them to prepare 
for the wedding. Mm -hmm. And if the whole village would shut down for the wedding, um, everybody would be invited. So, you know, this was, this was a situation where the whole village had to be able to shut down for the wedding. It wasn't right. just about the bride and groom. Right, you gotta get the wine ready. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> that too. I know. I know. I know. I remember in, in college, kids carried around a Boda bag. Does anybody remember that? Mm -hmm. A Boda bag was it was a thing, a skin thing to hold wine. Oh. And you carry it on your shoulder, and yeah, they pretend it was a purse wherever they were going. Yeah, but that not for wine. I just put water in it. Yeah. No, it's a Boda bag. It was yeah, for. Yeah, called a Boda bag. Yeah, it was for wine. It was a flask, right, Suzanne? Uh, well, it might have been a flask inside, but I think it was, I don't, they called it, it was like suede. Yeah, looks like yeah. It. on the outside it's like suede and then it had oh, it you know, yeah. 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 whatever you needed inside. Yeah, yeah. I could see it at football games, that's how you know. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, you know, and I think the main point Jesus is saying, you can't fit pieces of Jesus teaching into an old religion, into an old structure, an old way of thinking about God and worshiping God. It required a new structure. And so, you know, you know, when he came into Jerusalem, Jesus you know, turned over the tables and the money changers, it was correct. So the temple had to change the, the um, all these laws that had been put in place, reevaluated. You know, Jesus had come to fulfill the law, so he was, you know, he was trying to say, just get get rid of all of that. You've gotten so far removed from what faith and worship and God are about that you've lost total sight of it. And the only way to have the proper perspective is to begin anew. So, you know, John 3, unless we're born again, we can't see the kingdom of God. Um, it's that idea um, where we have to die to old ways of thinking and doing in order to embrace new ways of being. So that's, that's really the point that Jesus is making in this parable. Well, I wondered about um, the wine. It takes months for the grapes to turn into wine. Mm -hmm. So it takes a long time for us to become faithful Christians. That's a really good point. Yeah, Jesus knew this wasn't going to happen overnight, which is why for three years he kept really saying the same thing over and over again, you know, about having to... Um, to let the old ways pass and embrace the new ways. And in order to follow Jesus, you know, love your neighbors becomes paramount. And that was just something, your neighbors were, were there to help you survive. There wasn't, you know, the whole mode was a survival mode, whether it was religion, or whether it was life. So just even introducing the concept of love and grace um, was huge. People didn't marry out of love. They married for convenience, for expanding the farm, for you know being able to um, marry your daughter into the best family possible. Um, and sometimes, much worse than that. So people struggled to survive, you know? And so Jesus, you know, in trying to teach them this whole idea of loving your God, they didn't know how to do it. Yeah, so it took them, as you know, you know, as we see in the gospels, not even the disciples got it until after Jesus was resurrected. Oh, there were glimmers, you know, 
glimpses, Peter, you know, through the Christ, you know, there were glimpses of it, but then they kind of know it for a period of time and then go right back to where, where they were before until after Jesus had died and was resurrected and the Holy Spirit came and empowered them. So it, this was huge. You know, this kingdom that Jesus was ushering in was unlike any they could ever have imagined before and certainly nothing that they had ever experienced before. So, you know, and this was an oppressed culture too. Mm -hmm. You know, they lived under the footprint of Rome, of the empire. So, you know, to hear this, they had to have seen, thought Jesus was out of his mind when they first heard him. And I think that's why Jesus did all the miracles he did. And um, he had to show them that number one, he was of God. And number two, that he was able to do things that nobody else who was a rabbi could do. It was the only way to get their attention initially before he could really talk to them. He about, actually told them that, didn't he, Gene? I mean, he actually said to them, I am, uh, I'm trying to think which one, at least with Lazarus, he said, I will do this to show you yeah. mm -hmm. that my father sent me. I mean, he's right. trying to make it clear to everybody and they're just not getting it. They're not getting it. No. You know, and it's just, it, you, you think of your own self, it's probably been through it a hundred times, you know, <laughs> oh, oh yeah, 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 I get it, thanks. And then, I'm, so you're right, I think that seven miracles, whatever they were, uh, were to show them you know let me let me just prove this to you yeah right it, it's it's very curious very curious uh, way to go about it but he'd tell them and they wouldn't listen right out he told them who he was yeah no absolutely now you wonder if he were here right this minute would you pay attention probably not you're right you probably think he was crazy <laughs> you know i mean i'm not going there I'm not sure you would follow. I mean, I, I'm not sure I would. As a matter of fact, I doubt I would. Well, you know, and it's interesting because, you know, I certainly have seen this in every church I've served and you've seen it too. You know, there's sort of this passion for the old. You know, there's something about, well, this is the way we've always done it. So how, why, not, why, why do something different if the old worked? You know, we <laughs> all have that mentality. Um, change is very difficult for people to change from one way of thinking to another, one way of living to another. It changes is hard. You're absolutely right. I, one of the ones is uh, uh, the hymns. I just love my old hymns. You know, but now they play all the ones that you never heard before in your whole life, nor do you want to hear, or they have eight verses and you're sick of it by the time you're done with the message. I mean, where are my old sins? You know, but you're right. You don't like to try the new things. So you have to do it a little bitty at a time. And Nancy's right. It's a big, big, hard thing to do, to change. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think Jesus had to do those things, those miracles to show people. Yeah. Like you said, who would believe that now? You, you right. have to have some way to really, you know, get to the people. Yeah. No, I think that's true. And, you know, yeah, you think of any change in the church at all. And, you know, having been an interim pastor in a couple of churches, um, you talk about change, you get this new person coming in, you know, they're not here for very long. <laughs> you know, you're trying to kind of open their eyes to some of the patterns that have been happening in the church. Um, that they're not even aware of you know they don't even see in their midst and you know it's fascinating and, and you know we're all alike we we are so much more comfortable with what we know and what we do even if it isn't the best thing to know or do we do we just are 
because change requires what? What does change require on all of our parts? Effort. Yeah. A lot of effort. <laughs> and, and what else? Not just effort. Admitting that maybe mm. the way we were doing something before mm. wasn't mm. the best way. And that's as true in your home as it is in the church. That's why, it, well, for many reasons, it took five years to, you know, begin the actual expansion of the church and the renovation of it. But those five years were required. You know, there, if, if we had ever tried to um, add on to the church after one year of discussions, there would never have been the support that there is today as people began to gradually embrace, you know, gee, we really do need handicapped bathrooms. We really do need a place where people can be on one level so that they don't have to go up and down stairs or drive to the back, you know. So that took, but that took a long time um, in order for everybody to really grasp the vision and get on board. And that's true, whether it's a replacing an old hymnal with a new one, or, you know, <laughs> choosing a paint color for the sanctuary, <laughs> you know, it's um, because you're always going to have people with different perspectives and different definitions of what's the right thing to do. So, you know, and that's the reason why in a lot of cases, churches are so stuck and aren't able to move forward because they don't have the tools to be able to take the next step. You know, we're very blessed here. So, um, yeah, we're, we're like growing as opposed to some churches that I talked to some people that they have like four kids in their Sunday school where we have, it's getting more and more. Yeah. We're bringing in more younger families, I guess. Yeah. And I know we're all anxious to get back in person too, where we can actually see those families. <laughs> oh, <know>? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um but it will come it will come yeah. um how about individually though you know in terms of you can't you can't um put old wine or new wine into an old wine skin why does it need to be new wine that Jesus is putting into a new wine skin? You know, when you think about us personally, our faith, our spiritual development, what is that saying for us as people, people of faith? Maybe that we need to be open to new ideas or new ways of looking at things. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things I love about, you know, the Presbyterian motto, I, I would call it, you know, reformed and always reforming. The whole idea of the Reformation was that the church needed to change both the structures of the church as well as the way faith was being taught and experienced, all needed to change. But it's not reformed and stopped. It's always reforming, mm. you know, which means that God's always trying to do something new, both personally as well as 
corporately, you know, in the church. God's always trying to do a new thing. And then the question becomes, how often do we shut down that new thing from taking hold of us? So I think, you know, as an individual, again, that invitation to, to come and see um, and being transformed over and over again is very much a part of what Jesus was teaching. As long as the Holy Spirit is alive and well in our midst, we're never going to be stagnant. And if we are, then we're going to stay in the old wineskin. But as soon as we start growing and changing and growing in faith and discipleship, things have to change because we're led constantly in a different direction than we were before. It's not safe, you know? I think of um, the Chronicles of Narnia with Aslan the lion and the children go up, and, you know, to, to this lion, is he safe, is he safe? And they're told, no, you know, he isn't safe, but he is the way and the truth and the life, you know. So the only way to get to God is through Jesus Christ. But is he safe? No, he requires more of us than we ever want to give. And is constantly challenging us open our minds and our hearts to expand our wineskin a little. <laughs>